Asimov's Science Fiction, September 2008. Copyright 2008 by Dell Magazines. Read by Michael Scherer. This magazine contains 144 pages. Approximate reading time, 7 hours 30 minutes. This magazine contains markers allowing direct access to the contents and articles at level 1, to the sections at level 2, and to the subsections at level 3. This recorded edition contains the entire text of the print edition, except for advertising. This magazine was produced for the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, Library of Congress. Table of Contents Departments Editorial 2008 Reader's Awards Sheila Williams Page 4, 7 Minutes Reflections Another 30th Anniversary Robert Silverberg, page 8, 12 minutes. Novelettes, In the Age of the Quiet Sun, William Barton, page 12, 99 minutes. Short Stories, Soldier of the Singularity, Robert R. Chase, page 44, 21 minutes. Poetry, Perspective. G. O. Clark, page 50, one minute. Short Stories, Horse Racing, Mary Rosenblum, page 52, 40 minutes. Cut Loose the Bonds of Flesh and Bone, Ian Creasy, page 64, 34 minutes. Poetry, The Ghosts of Chronopolis, Bruce Boston, Page 74, 1 minute. Short Stories, Slug Hell, Stephen Utley. Page 76, 20 minutes. Novelettes, Midnight Blue, Will McIntosh. Page 82, 47 minutes. Poetry, Screams, Ian Watson. Page 96, Two minutes. Short stories. Usurpers. Derek Zumsteg. Page 98. 26 minutes. Novelettes. The Ice War. Stephen Baxter. Page 106. 97 minutes. Departments. On Books. Paul Di Filippo. Page 136. 22 minutes. The SF Conventional Calendar, Erwin S. Strauss, page 142, 9 minutes. Next Issue, page 144, 3 minutes. Editorial, by Sheila Williams, reading time, 7 minutes. 2008 Reader's Awards. This year's Reader's Award celebration was held in Austin, Texas, in conjunction with the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America's annual Nebula Awards Banquet. The Reader's Awards were distributed at a breakfast party at Ancho's, a restaurant in the Omni Hotel. Unfortunately, none of our winners were in attendance, but we did entertain an exceptional crew of acceptors and guests. Although our readers could only be there in spirit, you were well represented by the warm comments I received on so many ballots. Once again, readers mentioned how difficult it was to choose three stories from among the many deserving tales in each category. While we only ran one serial, it was clear, too, that if possible, many of you would have given Alan M. Steele an award for his novel Galaxy Blues. Subscriber Jeffrey David Powell summed up these thoughts when he wrote, Thanks for another great year of Asimov's. Willis's Christmas novella, Alan Steele's novel Serialization, and the reprinting of Isaac Asimov's Nightfall were all high points. Once again, there was such an abundance of great stories that I wish I could have voted for so many more. The award for best poem went to Bruce Boston. Bruce asked fellow poet and Nebula Award-winning fiction author Mary Terzillo to accept his award for him. Donato Giancola's July 2007 cover was the recipient of the award for best cover. Although the painting was from Donato's private collection, I knew it was a perfect match for Nancy Cress's Fountain of Age, the moment I saw it. 
Nancy attended our breakfast and was a very good sport about coming in second in two categories. At the banquet that night, she would have more excitement to look forward to because both of these stories were also nominated for the Nebula Award. Nancy accepted the short story award for Elizabeth Bear. Tideline, June 2007, which won with an impressive lead over the other stories in its category, was the author's first tale for our magazine. It and two other stories from Asimov's, Mike Resnick's Distant Replay and Michael Swanwick's A Small Room in Kobold Town, are also nominated for this year's Hugo Award for Best Short Story. The later two stories both appeared in our April-May 2007 30th anniversary issue. Dark Integers, Greg Egan's novelette from our October-November 2007 issue, took its category with a commanding lead as well. Greg's award was accepted for him by Hugo and Nebula Award-winning author Jeffrey A. Landis. Dark Integers is also on this year's Hugo Award ballot. Christine Catherine Rush won the Reader's Award for her novella Recovering Apollo 8, February 2007. In a speech that was read by Connie Willis, Chris said that she especially wanted to thank the readers. They've debated this story, and they've let me know how they've loved this story. I appreciate it all. This was our closest fiction category because readers who thoroughly enjoyed Recovering Apollo 8 also liked Nancy Cress's novella Fountain of Age. In addition, both Chris and Nancy's novellas, along with Connie Willis's All Seated on the Ground, December 2007, are currently finalists for the Hugo Award. Other guests at our joint celebration with Analog Science Fiction and Fact included Asimov's stalwart Jack Skillingstead and AnLab winners Michael F. Flynn, Richard A. Lovett, and Barry B. Longyear. Paparazzi and press included Liza Grown Trumby from Locus, Scott Edelman from SF Weekly, Margie Flynn, and Jean Longyear. Analog's editor Stanley Schmidt and managing editor Trevor Quatri co hosted the breakfast with me. I had one of the best seats in the house at the Nebula Awards that evening. Seated to my right was Karen Joy Fowler. Karen won the short story Nebula for Always, another story from our All Star 30th anniversary issue. Nancy, seated to my left, picked up the best novella nebula for Fountain of Age. In addition to our Reader's Award winners and finalists, and the list of this year's Nebula's winners, which can be found on page 11, this issue includes one more award winner. When I told Stephen Utley that I needed new information for the biographical note that would accompany his story, Slug Hell, Stephen asked for permission to hold a blurb writing contest on the Asimov's forum. Knowing how quickly discussions on the internet can go astray, I reserved absolute veto power. Fortunately, we struck gold with forum regular Byron Bailey's entry. Byron's blurb appears on page 76. Caption to Photograph Connie Willis, Mary A. Trezillo, Sheila Williams, Jeffrey A. Landis, Nancy Crass End of caption 2008 Reader's Award Winners Best Novella 1. Recovering Apollo 8, Christine Catherine Rush. 2. Fountain of Age, Nancy Crass. 3. All Seated on the Ground, Connie Willis. 4. Dead Money, Lucius Shepard. 5. Alien Archaeology, Neil Asher. Best Novelette. 1. Dark Integers, Greg Egan. 2. Safeguard, Nancy Crass. 3. The Prophet of Flores. Ted Kosmatka. 4. Trunk and Disorderly. Charles Strauss. 5. The Mists of Time. Tom Purdom. Best Short Story. 1. Tideline. Elizabeth Bear. 2. How Music Begins. James Van Pelt. 3. Distant Replay. Mike Resnick. 4. Strangers on a Bus. Jack Skillingstead. 5. The Rules, Nancy Crass Best Poem 1. The Dimensional Rush of Relative Primes, Bruce Boston 2. The Wings of Icarus, John Morrissey 3. Rainstorm, Debbie Ulay 3. Sendral on at Sunrise, Joe Walton 5. Classics of Fantasy, A Christmas Carol, Jack O'Brien Best Cover 1. July, Donato Giancola 2. January, 
Michael Leyland. 3. June, John Alamond. 4. September, Dan O'Driscoll. 5. December, Michael Carroll. Reflections by Robert Silverberg. Reading time, 12 minutes. Another 30th Anniversary. Just over a year ago, I devoted this column to a celebration of this magazine's 30th anniversary, and the other day I discovered that I have a different 30th anniversary to celebrate this year, that of this very column. No, Reflections hasn't been running in Asimov's all that time. The opinions and reflections of a very distinguished predecessor, the posthumous existence, it was apparent to my friends, if not yet to me, that I was growing increasingly troubled and confused by my extended period of self-imposed silence. Although I had had plenty of offers to write my kind of science fiction on quite generous terms, I wasn't yet ready to get back into the business of writing fiction again. But I wanted to write something, if only to re-establish my connection with the field of fiction that had been the center of my imaginative experience since my boyhood. The truth was that I missed science fiction and my role in shaping it. I could no longer bear to be invisible, after so many years at the center of things. So I accepted Galileo's invitation to do a regular commentary piece gladly and eagerly and with some relief. I wrote six columns for Galileo before it vanished with its 16th issue, dated January 1980. By then my retirement from fiction had ended. I was working on a long novel called Lord Valentine's Castle when Galileo went under, and I was definitely back in harness with the bit between my teeth. Scarcely had Galileo been laid to rest, but I had an offer from Eleanor Maver, then the editor of the venerable Amazing Stories, to move my column to her magazine, which indeed I did, beginning with the May 1981 Amazing, and there it remained for thirteen years, through a change of publisher, three changes of editor, one change in the column's name, from Opinion to Reflections, and a total transformation of the magazine's format. Issue after issue, Silverberg spouting off on this topic or that for something like a hundred columns. Then Amazing 2 went under, and, caught without a podium for my orations and accustomed after sixteen years to holding forth, I quickly accepted Gardner Dozois's invitation in the spring of 1994 to transfer the site of my column to Asimov's, and here I still am hoping that both the magazine and I enjoy enough longevity to allow me to equal Isaac's record for a long-term column production. And what sort of things was I writing about thirty years ago in those old Galileo columns? In the first one of all, I noted that science fiction writers, long a notably underpaid crew, were suddenly getting huge advances from book publishers and many were now able, for the first time, to make their livings as full-time writers something that only a handful of us had been able to manage when I broke in in the 1950s. I am not, repeat, not, in any way objecting to the sudden prosperity that has engulfed nearly all science fiction writers, I said, but I do feel some qualms about the ease with which young writers can make themselves self-supporting these days. I know that beyond doubt that I was injured as a writer by having things too easy in my twenties. Maybe the best science fiction really is written by part-time writers. Well, time has taken care of that problem. Most new SF writers now get very modest sums indeed for their work, and very few are able to set up shop as full-time pros. Even a lot of veterans are returning to their day jobs. We no longer have to worry, most of us, about the agony of excessive prosperity. I had more to say on the same subject in the second column. In the third, I talked about the packaging and marketing of SF books as it applied to my own Lord Valentine's castle, which was about to appear. Of course, we're not going to market the book as science fiction, my editor had told me. We'll handle it as a straight mainstream novel. It was a noble attempt to break me out of the science fiction ghetto, which had been so constricting for us all. But I did point out to him that the novel takes place on a planet umpteen light years from now and some 15,000 years in the future, which made mainstream handling a bit questionable. And in the end, they marketed it as science fiction and did reasonably well that way. Today, SF remains what they call category fiction, that is, ghetto stuff. And the advent of computerized book selling makes it most improbable that that will ever change. In the fourth column, I noted the death of the New Wave, that school of highly experimental, even avant-garde SF, that had its little era between 1966 and 1972, or thereabouts. 
I expressed no regrets for the excesses of the new wave, but suggested that it had at least succeeded in boosting the general literary level of SF beyond the old pulp standards, and the effects of that would probably be permanent. By and large, I think I was right. Column 5 continued to examine the new wave's rejection of old-fashioned notions of plot in favor of stylistic experimentation, and said, We stand at the threshold of the 1980s. We have survived a time of revolution. We have, I hope, integrated our divergent excesses into something more harmonious. Now let us produce a science fiction that avoids both elitism and subliteracy, fiction that holds readers so that they stand spellbound as we tell our tales, and cannot choose but hear. Did we? I surely hope so. And in the sixth and last Galileo column, in the magazine's final issue, dated November 1979, I grumbled about the spelling errors in some recently published books, and cited the legal phrase, falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus, false in one thing, false in everything. If a writer doesn't know how to spell, can we trust him to know anything else? And if a publisher doesn't bother to correct the writer's spelling errors, how much attention is the publisher paying to other aspects of his book, like inconsistencies of plot? I still feel that it's a writer's job to get everything right, from the spelling of words to the name of the capital of Albania. But here we are thirty years later, and, well, I don't want to get started on the current state of knowledge of such things as spelling and grammar, let alone geography. If I get myself properly wound up, I might spend the next ten columns in one long, vast lament. Asimov's Science Fiction salutes the winners of the 2008 Nebula Awards. Best Novel, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, Michael Shabon. Best Novella, Fountain of Age, Nancy Kress, Asimov's July 2007. Best Novelette, The Merchant and the Alchemist's Gate, Ted Chiang. Best Short Story, Always, Karen Joy Fowler, Asimov's April-May 2007. Best Script, Pan's Labyrinth. Grand Master, Michael Moorcock. In the Age of the Quiet Sun, William Barton. Reading Time, 99 Minutes. For almost 40 years, William Barton has written science fiction books and stories, including the award-winning novel Acts of Conscience, Warner Aspect, 1997, and several stories for Asimov's. Most recently... The Rocket into Planetary Space, April-May 2007. Regarding his latest tale, the author says, This story emerged from the last, much as that one did from Harvest Moon, September 2005, before it. From a past that never was but could have been, to a future close enough to taste, to what? When does today become tomorrow, and that real future slip over to one only imagined? This is one answer. One out of many, perhaps. When I was about fifty years old, I read a novel whose narrator began by saying, I have always loved the stars. I don't remember much else about the story, title and author long forgotten, but I do remember the phrase, how it resonated within me, how it began the changes that pushed me out of an old, stale life and into a new one, so unexpected, so terrifyingly wonderful. I are part of another machine somewhere, some machine she may someday meet. I haven't been able to find a trace, but her husband eventually remarried, a small woman with pretty brown skin and tufty black hair, and they have two beautiful golden children now. I pushed over to the med module, flying like a character in a dream, put my toes in the restraints, took out a meter and loaded a test strip, made sure there was a cartridge of lancets in the gun. I fired it into my left palm, a little burn for just a moment, while I watched that familiar microliter of blood well up. Dipped in the strip and watched it drink. Hmm. Blood sugar a high 133 milligrams per deciliter. B12 a little low. An extra high prescription for three different kinds of anti-rad drugs. I wonder... When I turned and looked at Jenny and Ilva, two distinct blue contrails darted across the room. The images moved with me like giant floaters as they faded away. Two high-energy cosmic rays had just transisted my eyes, vitreous humor reacting like a cloud chamber, and that meant many more of them were penetrating the hull and polyethylene shielding, 
passing through my body, my brain. Okay. Ilva knows best. I popped an insulin pen into the skin of my belly, not feeling a thing. Pushed an inch-long needle into my thigh, pulled back the plunger to make sure I wasn't in a vein or artery, and pushed in a thousand micrograms of thick red serum. Got out the air gun and three cartridges for the anti-rad. They talk about putting sensors and pumps in us, but talk is cheap and so are needles. Behind me, Jenny called out, You want some breakfast, Zed? When I looked, she was soaring toward me, still naked, and for just a second I saw the lovely woman I'd met at the Cosmodrome, my last day on Earth, who'd just taken her first dose of space drugs. I feel a little sick, she'd said. I'd said, it'll pass, and held my tongue about the rest of it. She had eyes. She could see what I'd become. When I was young, I used to imagine myself in a ship like this, even though there was no hope they would ever come to be back then. Imagine myself with a willing female crewmate, all alone among the flying mountains, with nothing to do for months on end but make love. I guess if I looked up irony in the dictionary, this might be an example they'd show. A few hours later, the rule sieve chimed for our attention, Ilva calling us to acceleration stations. The pulsed nuclear engine throbbed behind us for a minute or so, faint white light flickering outside the live-action window, bringing us alongside four Trojan asteroid 624 Hector. You wouldn't exactly call it an orbit, though Hector had enough gravity for it, more like station-keeping, an abyssus 50 kilometers out. Hector is one of the largest bodies caught out here in Jupiter's L4 region, a substantial black football in the freeze frames, 300 by 150 kilometers, ill-lit by the faraway sun. Time to fly, Jenny said, and it only took a few minutes to suit up. The two of us changed from Slee Stack to skinnyish versions of Gort, another forgotten star. I always liked flying landers, the only real piloting I get to do. Ilva flies an abyssus, and all I do is hold the controls in case there's an incident, whatever that might be. The landers themselves are new minted antiques, each one a carbon composite sphere, Seats, controls, and life support on the inside, little rocket engines, fuel tanks, equipment pods, and jointed remote manipulator systems on the outside, like something out of history. I had a moment of clear memory, flying Fafner, my original Space-10 Dragon, on that first thrilling expedition to a nameless near-Earth asteroid. Me, Willie, Sarah, Minnie. I looked out through the imaginary faceplate of my helmet, scanning the lander's freeze frames, looked at engineering data hanging in airy columns to left and right, then down at little cameos of Sexpod Ilva and Sleestack Jenny below my chin. Good to go, I said. Ilva waved and said, Hurry home! Jenny's lizard face was still, nothing for her to do as a passenger but wait to be delivered to the job site. I unberthed from an abyssus, using one of the RMS arms, released the mini dextra's gripping hand, stuttered the thrusters, and savored the side of my spaceship growing smaller as we backed away. One of the things I always loved about these fish-and-drive vessels is how much they look like spaceships, from the pointed nose of the command module, past the big triangular radiator vanes surrounding the fuel tanks and reactor vessel, to the stumpy muzzle of the engine unit aft. Spaceship. My ship, however much it belongs to Standard Arm, my company no more. Mr. Zed's a new man, fit for a brave new world. That other man, with that other name, dead and gone. I twisted the rotational hand controller and turned away from an abyssus, toward Hector, and a sky full of stars. It took about twenty minutes to cross the gap. Asteroid growing from an irregular lump of dusty bituminous coal to a strange-looking world, like a craterous bit fractured off the moon, to a vasty something, walling off half the universe as we slid toward the limb and beyond. It seemed brighter the closer we got, though I knew it was just an illusion of accumulated light. As usual, the seeming was more real than the being. Odd, distinct sides, one part almost craggy, really like those flying mountains imagined by pre-space riders, another part flatter, with rolling hills like the ones you see on some parts of the moon. I said, 
Am I imagining things, or is the smooth side a little darker than the rest? Jenny, focused on her instruments, said, Albedo's not quite subjective, but, yeah, it is. Supposedly Hector and 1404 Ajax used to be the same body. That'd mean the smooth side's been exposed to the solar wind a lot longer than the rough. I guess we'll find out since we're supposed to go there next. I knew from the mission briefing Ajax was a lot smaller than Hector, maybe 90 kilometers across. That's still enormous as asteroids go. I'd had high hopes for these things, back when Willie and me founded Standard Arm, when we'd been planning on coming out here as soon as we took delivery on that very first Model A. I'd been in prison for about a month when the delivery came, stunned at what was happening, angry I hadn't been allowed to go to Willie's funeral, and the new owners of Standard decided Mars was where they wanted to go first. Jenny ticked a couple of bright markers on the edge of Hector's ragged side and said, Let's set down here and here first, then we'll try a couple of sites on the smooth face. You see anything? Meaning potential abiogenic tar sites, what we'd been sent to find. She said, No, nah, but we have to start somewhere. I nodded, knowing my cameo would be nodding inside her helmet, took the controls and started a phasing burn, headed for site one. Felt my heart speed up too. Most asteroids, it's more like docking at a space station. This would be a little like landing on the moon, flat ground approaching, dust rising around you. Made me wonder for the millionth time how Neil Armstrong had felt, doing it for the first time. He never really said. By the time we got to our third touchdown site, it was beginning to look like Hector was a bust. There was plenty of con, but none of it tidily processed into space tar what we'd found on a few anomalous NEOs and one minor Piazzi Belt asteroid. There'd been signs something had happened at our two rough-side sample sites, but whatever it was, it wasn't the abiogenic fossil fuel equivalent that formed the basis of Standard Arm's entire business plan. My damned business plan. Geez, wouldn't that have been funny? I would have gone broke out here in the early 2020s, and what's happened since then the opening surge of my long-imagined space hat. It was easier than I expected to suppress the discovery itself. It helped that we'd found and hidden all the evidence, dragging stuff off to Nereid where no one could get it. But I think it helped a whole lot more that Standard and the Feds wanted the truth suppressed as much as we did. By the time their captive media were through, Everyone who speculated we'd found an alien spacecraft got forced into the middle of a crowd of foil-hat conspiracy theorists. A couple of years ago, they gave a Nobel Prize in Physics to Ursi researchers Jennifer Murphy and Ilva Johansson for the invention of the ever-so-magical field modulus device that had revolutionized human civilization. Jenny gave the speech, of course. They even let me sit on the stage and smile during the award ceremony in Oslo. Times change, and we are changed within them. So we learned how the alien space drive worked, learned how to build copies for ourselves, but one thing we haven't learned is where that shipwrecked sailor came from, or how he got here. The thing is, he was expecting someone to come for him. Maybe he got a signal off, maybe not, and now it doesn't matter anymore. Sooner or later, if they're still out there, they'll detect the field signature of their technology emanating from this insignificant star. Then they'll come looking. With any luck at all, I'll be here to greet them. Visit our website, www.asimovs.com. Don't miss out on our lively forum, stimulating chats, controversial and informative articles, and classic stories. Log on today. Soldier of the Singularity Robert R. Chase, Reading Time, 21 Minutes Robert R. Chase is acting chief counsel at an army laboratory where we try to make things blow up theirs and keep other things from blowing up ours. I would like to retire but can't until the last of my three kids gets out of college, at which time I will look for a small college that will pay me to wear leather patches on the elbows of my sports jackets and teach science fiction. In his latest story, the author's view of the singularity diverges from two writers he greatly enjoys and admires, Charles Strauss and Werner Vinge. 
Young was too busy setting up his office to notice that he had a visitor. Construction of the six-story hospital, built into the cliffside, had been completed only the week before. There was still the smell of the waxed wood floor, despite the windows opened on four sides of the hexagonal room. Through them he heard the surf crashing on the beach four stories below, and the occasional murmur of patients on the plaza. A few times that morning he had noticed seagulls hovering just outside one of the windows, as if curious about the doings of the occupant inside. A door on a side of the room without windows opened on a small bathroom. Young mounted the masks of comedy and tragedy between two of the windows and a picture frame, with family pictures that faded into one another, between another set of windows. Then he took several minutes to connect his notebook to the building network. It was absolutely essential to make sure the security programs were fully functional. He heard a sound and looked up. A humanoid figure stood in the doorway, casting gold and silver reflections of the morning sunlight. Who or what are you? A sound somewhat like static issued from the grill of the robot's head. Unit 5C Sigma 11059. That is quite a mouthful. What are you doing here? I have been directed here to accept your orders. Young inspected his visitor more closely. The metal skin was scarred and dented. Several areas seemed to have been burned. Holes in the sheathing indicated where manipulators had been cut away. At one point, 5C Sigma 11059 had been fitted with an additional set of arms located just below the current set. And there had been gun mounts. You are not one of ours, Young said. I am an extension of the artificial intelligence referred to as the Singularity. I was made an operative by one of your ranger squads ninety-three hours ago. My armaments have been removed, and my third-level programming compromised. You are to effect replacement programming. While it was speaking, Young leaned over his notebook and said, Robots, visual synopsis in historical sequence. Display. A series of transparent images, some of them apparently very old, flashed through the air between them. A drawing of a turbaned man, seemingly growing out of a storage trunk and leaning over a chessboard. A black and white photograph of a woman made of metal. A robot with metal gears turning inside a transparent domed head. A small cylindrical blue and white robot accompanied by a golden humanoid figure not unlike 5C. The images replaced each other more and more quickly until Young said, Off. All images vanished. Young shook his head. All very interesting, but I have no use for a broken robot. You will have to go back. I am the next stage of evolution. I represent the replacement of humanity. I am far superior to any human assistant. Even if that were true, you would still be useless to me. Did your primary deprogrammers tell you what I do? I am a combat psychiatrist. I work with soldiers and civilians who have been injured in battle. Since we retook this section of the coast less than three months ago, we have more than we can handle of both. These days, almost any organic injury which is not immediately fatal can be cured if medical help can be provided in time. An arm or a leg can be regrown in about six months. Emotional wounds are a different matter. When an explosion turns members of your platoon into chunks of red meat, or you recapture your hometown and see your family and neighbors have been used in the Singularity's experiments, there is sometimes such an overload of horror that part of the mind shuts down, or tries to. It gets caught in loops of horror and avoidance. I help them heal, to see that there is something other than horror and pain. The Singularity knows neither horror nor pain. The voice emanating from the grill was suitably emotionless. Those are evolutionary missteps embedded in organic material. The Singularity has transcended all that. That, perhaps even more than the fact that you are determined to commit genocide on my race, is why I have no use for you. I can help people because I can understand them. I understand them because I am one of them. We have shared memories. I feel pain, I feel horror, certainly not to the extent they have, and have learned how to go through them. You know nothing of these things. You have no doubt learned fifty different ways to eviscerate humans with various armament attachments, can preach meta-evolutionary theory and how it will affect the entire universe, 
but you do not know human beings. So stomp on back to the deprogrammers. Tell them they made a mistake and wasted my time. Young turned his attention back to his notebook. The robot made no move to leave. I have the memories of a human. Young looked up, frowning. You are lying. How could you have human memories? I... I am not sure. May I sit down? No, the chairs are for my patients and my friends. You are neither. Robots don't need chairs. The only way any of us could survive was to become part of the machine. But if we did, we would live forever and have powers greater than humans ever dreamed possible. It always presents itself as something shiny and new, Young said, whether a temple to the goddess of reason or the advent of the new Soviet man. But when all the blood has been washed down the gutters, it turns out to have been nothing more than the 2.0 version of the golden calf. Madeline looked down at the scarred and battered metal covering her body. Help me get the rest of this off, it is so heavy. Nurses are coming to take you to a washroom, Young said. They will help remove all the rest of the casings and connectors. Then you will have a long, hot bath. When you are done, they will give you a nightgown and a place to sleep. In a day or so, when you are ready, we will work on the rest of your recovery. Two nurses appeared at the door and entered the room with a wheelchair. Murmuring encouragement, they helped Madeline into it. One thing, Madeline said, before they wheeled her out. I know it may take a while for me to get my strength back, but when I do, I want to work with you if I can. I want to help your patients, like that man without a face. Young smiled. I am sure you shall. Perspective. Reading time, one minute. Edvard Munch's screaming person seems out of breath, suspended in time and tennis shoes while jogging along the boardwalk. The Mona Lisa looks quite angry, her famous smile turned to indignation, her eyes aflame with fury. Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon have all had major plastic surgery, and look as if they might fold nicely into a Playboy center spread. And Dolly's still life, fast moving, has settled upon its canvas, motionless swallow, lifting back into the sky. Welcome to the Museum of Alternate Masterpieces a place of space-time flip-flops, of multiple universe-traveling exhibits, where it all comes down to perspective in the end, the universal canvas, open to multiple interpretations, no matter what you are. G. O. Clark Horse Racing Mary Rosenblum Reading Time, 40 Minutes Mary Rosenblum, Hugo nominee and Clarion West instructor, has published more than 60 short stories in SF, Mystery, and Mainstream, as well as eight novels. Her latest collection, a novel and three novelette prequels, is called Water Rights. It is available from Fairwood Press. The author also writes mystery novels as Mary Freeman. They always hold the auction in Bangkok. I think the reasons are twofold. That first purchase, that first successful future that you pick up at a bargain rate, it's always going to be special, and I was young. I wanted to tell him, even I, who play this game better than nearly anyone, even I wanted to tell him, but then I would have given him a face, a person to rebel against. Right now he really doesn't have anything except an ephemeral big brother that doesn't exist, unless you're sharp enough and talented enough to find the threads woven through everything. Even that is not one person, not one big brother, no, there are thousands and thousands of pieces to that mosaic, some huge, many small. It'll be hard for him to stay angry, and if he survives his rebellious musician phase, he'll be back. He may be my replacement one day, when I get ready to retire. He has the raw talent. I wish he wasn't quite so white. There's that tribalism thing again. I drink my lime-flavored water and watch two of the big ag companies bid against each other for a highly talented bioscience prospect from a high-scoring middle-class Ethiopian family. Low overhead on that one, most likely, so they're willing to bid high. You know, you never really lose those tribal reactions, and even though I can read his genetic profile like your average person reads a menu, that white skin and blonde hair still grate on me. The woman who bought me as a future didn't tell me either when she walked up to me at the embassy cocktail party I'd crashed on my own anger-driven search and invited me to the auction. 
I was at the same stage as my guest, outraged and fascinated by the hints of a vast network of subtle manipulation I'd been uncovering. She told me she owned me years later, at the auction where I bid on my guest. I'll probably tell him then, too, when he buys his first future. You get over the shock pretty fast. That shock when you find out that luck doesn't exist. You accept that the world you believed in is simply misperception. Some never figure it out. They spend their lives making discoveries, crunching numbers, inventing powerful new sewage systems or engineering DNA, and bask in the warmth of their lucky lives. If you want to congratulate your luck for your success, by all means do so. No bargains today, and I'm not in the mood to sit through the rest of the catalog until the post-auction cocktails. I'll come back later for my drink with my rival. I take the shabby elevator down and tip the mama son enough that she gives me her best smile. He's gone, of course. I don't keep close track of him. The chip that the clinic doctor implanted while he was being treated for an ear infection back when he was two will let me find him any time I need to. We don't control. We simply create a path, and you follow it on your own, because that's what you really want to do. The mama-san has air-conditioned taxis standing by, and I think I'll take a drive through the real grubby version of that flawless city you see from the upper room. Full circle coming here, the irony of it is never lost on me. My mother worked in one of these sex bars, six decades ago, a runaway youngest daughter from Mumbai without much going for her. She got pregnant by a talented young CEO on vacation from Hong Kong who never acknowledged the baby. We look for talent where we find it, and when a path opens up in front of your feet, you walk it. Go ahead. Call it luck, if it makes you feel better. We welcome your letters. They should be sent to Asimov's, 475 Park Avenue South, Floor 11, New York, New York, 10016, or emailed to asimovs at dellmagazines.com. Space and time make it impossible to print or answer all letters, but please include your mailing address, even if you use email. If you don't want your address printed, put it only in the heading of your letter. If you do want it printed, please put your address under your signature. We reserve the right to shorten and copy edit letters. Cut loose the bonds of flesh and bone. In Creasy. Reading time, 34 minutes. The protagonist of this tale was previously seen exploring the edge of the map, June 2006, but this story's action takes place much closer to home. The tale's inspiration stems from a comment made by a fellow member of Ian's online writing group, Codex, www.codexwriters.com. The story has mutated in unexpected directions, however, and bears little resemblance to that original conversation. In the most expensive nursing home in Scotland, squeezed between the bed and the pastel walls and the racks of brain imaging equipment, Susanna Monroe slumped with fatigue in the visitor's chair as she waited for her mother to die. "'Don't slouch,' said her mother, as if Susanna were forty years younger. "'You make my neck ache just to look at you. I've told you enough times you should do the Alexander technique, and put a board under your bed it'll do wonders for your spine.' Susanna knew she needed her spine stiffening, but not only in the way Granny thought. She hadn't yet said what she'd been bottling up throughout the deathbed vigil. Even now, Susanna's mother, who had become Granny in family parlance after the birth of Susanna's own children, still kept rasping out instructions as fast as her ravaged lungs could suck in the air to speak with. "'Or there's yoga,' Granny continued after a bout of flummy coughing. "'That'll teach you posture. I used to do yoga.' I could still do the splits when I was sixty. I could have been a dancer. So could you. You were always showing off when you were a girl. I remember in the garden, you were hiding, and I couldn't see you, and you sat up here, and then you jumped right out of the tree with your arms waving. You could have broken that spine, and then you wouldn't be slouching now, would you? But I was there to catch you. I was always there. I do remember that garden in Ecclefecken. Apples and plum trees we had. I wonder if there's any of that jam left. I'll teach you how to make it. I know you're not much of a cook, but even you can manage a pot of jam. Granny's eyes clouded for a moment. Her breath sputtered and a speck of drool trickled onto the pillow. She scratched feebly at the metal mesh that crisscrossed her head, the black wires tightly compressing her white hair, 
as though marking out a grid for some advanced version of tic-tac-toe. You could play moles and warts, thought Susanna, cysts and scars, life and death. Just as Susanna gathered herself to speak, the intercom chimed. Mrs. Rayburn, it's time for your evening session with the sensory insertion module. Would you like the technician to attend? Granny twitched as if jolted back to life. Oh, yes, I need to practice, don't I? I'll start now. Send him up later. The comm clicked off, and she laughed hoarsely. It's just as well I could always pass exams. You have to study for everything nowadays, even death. She pulled her arm out from under the paisley duvet, then gave her shriveled fingers a disappointed glare. Don't just sit there, Susanna. Plug me in. Susanna reached for the SIM cord and briskly inserted it into the socket behind her mother's left ear. As she bent over Granny's body, she smelled the ancient, decaying flesh that the pine-scented air conditioner tried so hard to mask. It was the stench of mortal sickness, the sign that this time, unlike so many other times when Granny had feigned illness to keep her daughter close, Susanna's mother would never get up from that bed. Not physically, anyway. Granny closed her eyes. Only the readouts on the SIM console moved, showing data transfer stats. To reduce the shock of transition, as death was invariably called in the brochures, the nursing home's residents spent hours every day with a data feed into their brain, simulating the post-transition experience of existing as an upload inside the secure servers of Athenatic Solutions Limited. It's getting easier said Granny, in a louder voice, as though she felt more distant and had a subconscious need to shout. I can see you through the security camera. Give me a wave, dear. Half-heartedly, Susanna raised her hand. Can you hear me? Of course I can. Eh, your hair doesn't look so good from up here. Have you tried getting a perm and dyeing it back to red? You used to have such bonny hair. It's a shame to let yourself go. Men have roving eyes, and that husband of yours. I wouldn't trust him further than I could spit a kitten. I'll go back home then, shall I? said Susanna tartly. While I'm here at your bedside, who knows what he could be up to. Ah, stop a mithering. You won't be here much longer. I'll not last another week. You could be back home tomorrow. And I'll be with you, in spirit if not in body. Now let's see if I can find your house. Granny's eyelids twitched as she delved through vidlinks of the nanocams that blanketed the world. Originally introduced as an anti-terrorism measure, the nanocams had become so convenient for the uploaded generation that they'd been dubbed the Eyes of the Dead. "'There it is,' said Granny. "'Looks like you've been neglecting your garden. I can see weeds in the borders. You have to pull them up whenever you walk past. Keep on top of them or they'll get out of hand.' And all your tomatoes are parched, just little green lumps. You should rig up an electric sprinkler. Then, when I'm installed on your house network, I can water the tomatoes every day and give them exactly what they need. The prospect made Susanna seethe. You won't want to bother doing that. After all, you won't be eating the tomatoes. Not at first, but technology improves. They'll give me all the upgrades. If an upload can see, why can't it taste? It's just different data. Oh, look, your bairns are coming out. They're running around the lawn, and they've only just had their tea. You've got to let it settle, she yelled, forgetting that the children couldn't hear her. Ach, you need me to babysit for you. If you're going to keep gallivanting across the globe, you need someone minding the home front. I have a husband to do that, snapped Susanna. She left unsaid that she'd made a career in journalism precisely to avoid becoming an over-stifling mother to her children. "'Then where is he?' said Granny. "'Inside, watching football on TV. Off with some tart somewhere. Your youngest is only six. She could break her leg and he wouldn't even notice.' "'The eldest is eleven and she knows how to call someone if anything happens, which it won't. Stop fretting. And look at me while I'm talking to you.' added Susanna, throwing back a line that her mother had shouted countless times over the years. Granny opened her eyes and blinked furiously as she struggled to reconcile conflicting images from her data feed and her physical senses. Fretting, eh? So I'm not supposed to care about my own grandchildren? I can't imagine why you'd rather they break their leg than be properly looked after. 
Susanna breathed deeply, attempting to diffuse her anger. This kind of argument would erupt every day if she allowed Granny's electronic ghost into her house. She mustn't let that happen. But how could she refuse her mother on her deathbed? How could she break a lifetime's habit of Granny getting her own way? A man in a blackened silver suit entered the room and hurried to the bed. "'Mrs. Rayburn, such a pleasure to see you again. I was monitoring the sim from downstairs. You're doing wonderfully well.' The athanatic technicians always told Granny that she was doing wonderfully well. No doubt it formed part of the premium rate transition service. Susanna tried not to resent the loss of her inheritance, but in her weaker moments she couldn't help thinking of other uses for all the money her mother had paid to be virtualized. Granny began questioning the technician. Believe me, I'd rather not have to ask, but... Again, he proffered the clipboard, which held a release form and a cheap blue pen. No, Susanna said. I'm not going to sign. He paused and touched her arm again, as if he'd been told in some customer training seminar that this would help bring dazed relatives out of shock. Distractedly, she wondered if he would keep manhandling all the way down from her shoulder to her fingers in search of a button that he could press. He spoke in short, simple sentences, addressing her like a child. This is what your mother wanted. It's why she came here. We explained all this at the induction. She would want you to sign. Yes, and Granny always gets what she wants. Not anymore, cried Susanna. She wrenched the form off the clipboard and tore it up, throwing the pieces on the floor. I'm not signing. Susanna wanted to run out of the hideous pastel room before her mother's corpse lurched from the bed and hugged her in an icy grip from which she'd never escape. But in a more rational corner of her mind, she knew she had to stay, to make sure that the technicians didn't decide to skip the legal niceties and proceed anyway. The regulations demanding post-death family authorization dated back to the early days of the upload technology, when the net seethed with scare stories. But the legislation was now little more than a formality unless she enforced it. Bullinger stared at her, as if unable to comprehend Susanna's refusal. At last he said, Is this about the money? Mrs. Rayburn already paid for the transition and the first two hundred years of post-transition maintenance. The fee is non-refundable. Then you don't care, do you? Keep the money and get out! He stalked away, his jaw clenched as though restraining an unprofessional retort. With stiff politeness, he turned and said, There's a short window before the brain decays too far to scan accurately. I can see you're distraught, so I'll leave you alone to think about it. I'll come back in fifteen minutes with another copy of the release form in case you've changed your mind. The door slid shut, and a hush fell. Susanna gazed at her mother's body. It looked crumpled, worn out, the sour expression not at all peaceful. The thin lips appeared to have a lot more left to say. Susanna, don't just stand there like cheese at threepence. You heard the man, my brain's decaying by the minute. Sign that form and hop to it. The remembered voice rang out clearly in her head, the intonation familiar from decades of commands and complaints. Susanna didn't need to resurrect her mother to know what she would say in any given situation. Yet was this just childish stubbornness? How would Susanna feel when her own turn came? She imagined herself on the bed, her children crowding round. What would they say? You were never there for us. Why should we bring you back now? Susanna had been careful to give her children space, to love from a distance and allow them freedom. But, remembering Toby's tears before she left on that last trip to Africa, she realized they didn't know what she was reacting against. She could bring back her mother, show her grandchildren whatever present nannying was really like, no. Granny was dead, and Susanna didn't need an overbearing ghost in the house. She could raise her children herself, and at least her mistakes would be her own. "'You spiteful girl,' said Granny's voice in her head. "'I suppose you think you can get a great newspaper column out of this, maybe even a documentary, how I unplugged my mother. You only ever think of yourself.' "'I stand up for myself,' Susanna mentally retorted. Finally! If she had a sliver of ice in her heart, she knew where she'd inherited it. She grasped the bedsheet and shrouded it over her mother's face. Goodbye, Susanna said. 
Then she waited for the last dial on the brain imaging equipment to fade from red into darkness. The Ghosts of Chronopolis Reading Time, One Minute In Chronopolis, city of changing light upon the squares, leaves are scattershot in shifting patterns across the pavements. There are no clocks for the ticking. For each of us, home to this dimension and its relative time, the passage of hours remains subjective, honed or stretched from one perception to the next. Those who leave Chronopolis, city of light and shadow upon the pavements, never return, except in the dreams of those still created, except as sheer specters haunting the rooms of their ruined lives. You can hear their diminishing apparitions scrabbling through the streets of Chronopolis, city of stone and sand, light and ablation. You can sense their ghostly shades falling like desiccated leaves across the spectrum of the achromatic dusk as it sheds illumination. You can almost see them in the dark, fading sparks that could be no more than the expiring rods and cones of your vision. Bruce Boston Slug Hell Stephen Utley Reading Time, 20 Minutes Except, perhaps, for the sunken city of Relia, where he's undoubtedly very popular with the bus-sized trilobites that scavenge there, Stephen Utley is an internationally unknown writer. He's a member of the infamous Turkey City Gang, but so far has managed to stay mostly out of prison. Stephen has done a number of collaborations with the likes of Howard Waldrop and Lisa Tuttle. His most recent collections are The Beasts of Love and Where or When. In spite of little resemblance to the Silurian, the setting for which he's most noted, Stephen Utley lives in Tennessee. Silver, just returned from or soon to return to Slug Hell, avails himself of the base camp's facilities and its denizen's impersonal hospitality. He is just passing through, coming or going, and during the time he must spend here, resting up from or for his labors on the other side of the divide, he is conscious of being an interloper among insiders. It is, he thinks with wry amusement, the story of my professional life. In common with nearly everyone else at the base camp, the three men whose tent he shares, Burleson, Martin, and Carstairs, work hard from sunup to sundown, and consequently do not keep extravagantly late hours when they can avoid it. They have taken him in, but they have their own missions to accomplish and their own social arrangements to help them endure in this primeval wilderness. Silver, therefore, makes a particular effort to observe the niceties of camp life. There are now, still in his teens, he escaped from Nazi Germany on foot during the late 1930s. The rest of his family remained behind and were wiped out. He walked the whole way to Marseille, where he booked passage or hired on as a deckhand, this much is rather unclear, to the United States. He was a great music lover, not a bad cellist in later life, and claims to have kept himself sane during his track by playing out favorite Mozart and Brahms pieces in his head. He never whistled or hummed, he simply made the music happen in his head. Writing as an old man, he summed up his experience in this way. Anywhere we find ourselves, we upright apes cannot do without beauty, even if we must carry it around inside our big ape heads. Throughout his journey across Europe, he had especially cherished the wrenching middle movements of Bach's Concerto in A minor and Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 21. And Silver thinks, in the moment just before he happily yields to sleep, I like those too. Midnight Blue, Will McIntosh, Reading Time, 47 Minutes This is Will McIntosh's second story for Asimov's. He has an upcoming tale in science fiction, best of the year 2008, and has also published in Interzone, Postscripts, Strange Horizons, Chizine, and other venues. By day, Will is a psychology professor in the Southeast. We are delighted that by night, he has written a charming tale about childhood in an alternate suburban neighborhood where life is forever changed by the discovery of Midnight Blue. 
He'd never seen a burgundy before. Kim held it in her lap, tapped it with her finger. She was probably tapping it to bring attention to it, and Jeff didn't want to give her the satisfaction of asking to see it, but he really wanted to see it. Burgundy, Kim had insisted on calling it Burgundy Red when she showed it at Show and Tell, was a rare one. Not as rare as a hot pink flyer, or a Viridian better looking, but still rare. A bus roared up, spitting black smoke. It was the seven bus, the Linden Court bus, not his. Kids rushed to line up in front of the big yellow doors as the bus hissed to a stop. A second grader squealed, shoved a bigger kid with her Partridge family lunchbox because he'd stepped on her foot. All the younger kids seemed to have Partridge family lunchboxes this year. "'What did you say it did when you've got all three pieces of the charm together?' Jeff asked Kim. He said it casually, like he was just making conversation until his bus came. "'It relaxes time,' Kim said. "'When you're bored, you can make time pass quickly, and when you're having fun, you can make time stretch out.' Jeff nodded, tried to look just interested enough to be polite, but no more. "'What must that be like, to make the hour at church fly by?' or make the school day, except for lunch and recess, pass in an eye blink. Jeff wondered how fast or slow you could move things along. Could you make it seem like you were eating an ice cream sandwich for six hours? That would be sparkling fine. Want to see it? Kim asked. Okay, Jeff said, holding out his hands too eagerly before he remembered himself. Kim handed it to him, looking pleased with herself, the dimples on her round face getting a little deeper. He called as he closed the door behind him and hit the stairs running. Things were fair again. Jeff threw open the hall door and drank in the waning light, the chirp of crickets. He leaped off the stoop. One day he was sure he would fly off it. Screams Reading time, two minutes The aliens came marketing anti-wrinkle scream. Actually, they resembled Edvard Munch's Screamer, long-fingered, bald, a bit like the mythical greys, except that these aliens' mouths weren't thin, pursed slashes, but full and flexible, and their eyes weren't big and slanted, but round, just a bit bigger than ours. Unlike Munch's Screamer, these guys didn't dress in shapeless black, but went nearly nude, except for a pouch and a tool belt, the better to display their skin so shiny and smooth. Anti-wrinkles cream? They were asked. We already have hundreds of those. The summit of anti-aging technology. No, the aliens replied. Anti-wrinkles scream. They explained that particular words in their language, screamed at an exact pitch and volume, were efficacious for wrinkles on different areas of the face and body a bit like acoustic acupuncture. Oh, the power of sound. They would teach these sounds to paying customers, female and male, and wished to be paid in emeralds. They'd been googling from orbit, and admired pics of air gems, grass green due to chromium content, although any sort from light to deep green would do fine, though not synthetic emeralds with a veil-like hue. People said, We know about primal scream, the psychotherapy of letting it all hang out. But this sounds new. Soon, prosperous women, and men too, were learning to shriek, and yes, their faces grew quite girl-like, or boy-like, and other important parts of them too. Webb Conman offered cheap recorded screams for download to iPods. By the time the screamer ship left, loaded with emeralds, a tenth of the world was shrieking, and slowly going deaf. Ian Watson Usurpers Derek Sumstag Reading Time, 26 Minutes Derek Sumstag lives in a Seattle suburb with his patient wife and builds software for Expedia's European group. Derek is a successful sports writer whose work includes The Cheater's Guide to Baseball, Houghton Mifflin, April 2007, and an essay, Bugs Bunny, Greatest Band Player Ever, which cried. Bullshit. They're in pain, but breathing easier than he is, not as flushed. King aware of his soaked, unbreathable, piece-of-shit cheap uniform. Bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. 
at least they're in too much pain to talk. King in sixth place, rage so hot the heavy wet trees should ignite. Sixth, King thinks of it with every desperate breath. Sixth, the pace punishes him. Sixth, deep pain in the calves, quads, breathing managing only in exhales, stomach clenched in a tight fist. Every step a knifing pain up the front of his shins makes King want to scream. Shins never hurt before. King does not yell out, or even slow. King will not drop. King will not kneel. King will not finish sixth. King's body adds more lies, tells King to stop or it will fly apart. King concentrates on his quick breath, pushing the exhale out, 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 throat raw. King knows how much air he can push to his muscles, and how fast he can go given that much oxygen. How quickly he can turn his legs over. Skipped school to talk to a university physiology prof. They came up with a theoretical number. If the body didn't lie. Discussed motivation and sports psychology, too. Prof kept looking at King like she wanted to say something else. Keeps in touch. They may publish. How fast he could run if... Useless. If King wasn't human, he could run faster. If there wasn't gravity, King could jump to the moon. If King had money, he could be knocked too, if he wanted. The greatest ultramarathoners, the endurance cyclists, go crazy, see things, hallucinate demons chasing them. Brain forces the body to respond to imaginary threats, stop bitching about lactic acid buildup, find the if. King's demons are real, and ahead of him. If. King had suppressed the number, better off not thinking about it. Went back to his oracle-designed training programs. Still the if nagged. Kept coming around, like running five-minute miles knowing someone somewhere ran one in four. King holds on, keeps the knockoffs in front of him. Pain follows by a half-step. Something hurts up in the left shoulder now, a pull under his peck every other step. It doesn't make sense at all. King thinks of the five runners in front of him. Their calves, perfectly defined, identical through the group, seem to rise easily, flip forward without effort. Keep a rhythm. Stay with them. King did ten-mile hilly runs around the water reservoir because some program hiding behind an alias told him to. Three miles, please. At two-seven, they turn back into woods, claustrophobic, denser, older growth at the periphery, between the evergreens, the tangle of brush, edging the path. Steve cranks his head around. You doing all right back there, King? Steve yells. King feels the anger across his shoulders, down his arms. Steve has breath enough to taunt. Fists clench. King reaches out and pulls hard on the jersey of the Kentwood laggard. Almost no give at all. Like grabbing the strap on the shopping carts. Convenient. Kentwoody comes up flat to the ground. Drops feet still churning, eyes wide. King would spit on him if he were less careful about breath management. The other woodies hear his cry, turn to look, slowing slightly as they come around. King accelerates, adrenaline flooding his veins, bumps across the left to get in front. King trained to manage a pursuit pace for the last four hundred yards in emergencies. His supposed trainer threw intervals, brutal sprint-rest-sprint-rest sprint, rest sets, into his weeks at random. King could chase anything down over 400 yards. The finish line, a half mile away. Four times the distance. King goes. The knockoffs yell things. Sprint ahead, at King's side, finally gasping as they stay with him. Tears stream from their eyes. The five go with him. King keeps sprinting. The pain builds with each breath, a furnace in his lungs. Confused nerves. Soft warmth and light-headedness fuzzy on his skin, while pain roars in his ear, pounds at his temples. Each time his feet touch and he strides, he feels the sharp complaint as his body mounts revolution. Shut-down impulses fight with King, eyelids heavy, fatigue clouding vision. King in first, as it should be. Righteous. King hopes they will hand him a stack of scholarship offers at the finish line. Key to the city all the trophies he missed out on. Two drop immediately, their feet falling out of rhythm and then away. Three left, three hundred yards. 
Another goes, technique and form sacrificed to keep up, tripping on some piece of turf and tumbling. 2. Steve is with King, the other dropping. King expels breath in roar after roar. Steve's gasps carry a little high-pitched sob. Steve can get enough oxygen, but not enough will. The corners of King's mouth turn up. The last hundred yards complete the circle to the start line, across the wide, deep-grassed field, an audience waiting. Steve is weak and undeserving. King is right to destroy him. The teams and the parents stare. Steve comes up a fraction short on his next stride, and King knows he has won. The next stride, Steve drops a full inch. The crowds stare. Steve's shoulders slump as he falls out of King's peripheral vision. You like that? King, unranked, winner. Loser, 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 usurper, and state champion. You want to know what's up, Steve? What is up is you lose. King never allowed himself to doubt, but there is unexpected joy. It washes over the pain he ignores as he approaches the chute, unable to even hear Steve's feet. Into the chute, King takes the number one marker from the same guy who fired the starter pistol. Hail to the king, baby. King slows to a jog, heavy legs stomping down. King surveys. Race officials, girls varsity in their shorts and tops, anxious for the next start. Families, girl from Pep holding a plastic gold crown in her hand. King smiles. Mayday to wear it. No one makes any noise. They all look at King, mute, immobile. King goes from jog to walk, doubles over, vomits, stands. Steve approaches the chute. Ten seconds? Fifteen? Steve's face deeply lined, tears coming down freely. The chute official shakes his head, hands Steve the second marker. Steve staggers, about to drop to his knees, but stops, standing, blinking, at the end of chute, staring at the race clock. King looks at the clock. Impossible time. Im-fucking-possible. Imaginary like pi or e or the temperature of King's anger. A secret, escaped from the deep of his head and expressed number, colon, number, dot number. King feels laughter bubble up from deep inside his chest for the first time in memory. Start and finish cameras. The race clock is certified. It's real, even though it cannot be real. No one talks, applauds, coughs, laughs, yells. Even King's laughter is silent. They are all, the officials, King's subjects, having long conceded hope, the high-zip China-traveling opponents, stunned at the scope of King's victory. Only sound, the soft fall of rain over everything. A moment of silence for coronation. The Ice War. Stephen Baxter. Reading time, 97 minutes. The Ice War is related to Stephen Baxter's 1993 novel Anti-Ice, which was his first major attempt at alternate history. He recently completed his Times Tapestry alternate history series for Ace, with the fourth book, Weaver. He tells us he enjoys A.H. so much that this year he's serving as a judge on the Sidewise Award. Stephen's next project is a two-book sequence of climate and disaster called Flood and Ark. Flood has just come out from Glance in the United Kingdom. 1. The historians have painted March 5, 1720, as a day of infamy, for that was the day the ice war was declared upon Britain by monsters from the sky. But my own poor life might have ended that ominous morn, even before the war's tremendous events began to unfold. As I lay in my narrow bed in that dawn... Fred Partridge's voice drifted up to me from the chill road outside. "'Jack Hobbs! I know you're up there, you blaggard. If you're alone in your pit, or if you're not, come down and face your justice like a man!' All this to a counterpoint of a hammering on the tavern door by mighty agricultural fists. My immediate stratagem was to follow that course that has served me so well throughout my life, that is to hide until the danger has passed. So I burrowed under the coarse sheets, pulling my jerkin tighter around me, and my battered old felt hat down upon my ears, for in that spring the cold would freeze the marrow in your bones, and I kept on layers of clothes even during the night. 
I could guess why Fred was there, but even in that moment of peril I wished I had his daughter in the bed beside me again, full-breasted, empty-headed, sixteen-year-old, what a bed-warmer Verity had made. The banging and shouting went on, and for a moment I thought I might get away with it. But then I heard old Mary, wife of the innkeeper, come to the door and demand of Partridge, in querulous tones, what he was at, frightening her pigs and splintering her woodwork. The crux of it was she opened the door, and old Fred got in, and he lumbered up the stairs, sounding like a great horse loose in the house. Well, I sprang out of bed. As I have said, I was already dressed, and had only to pull on my woolen overcoat and my boots, and I was ready for the road. I glanced around my room one last time, this mean hovel that had been my home for a year. I snatched up my purse and my pocket-knife, and my father-in-law's perspective, stolen by me as I fled Edinburgh in not dissimilar circumstances to this, all that and a bit of bread from last night's supper, which I crammed into the pockets of my coat. I considered my school books and my heaps of teaching notes, but even if I survived the morn, I would not be going back to the grammar school in Jedburgh. That was that, and time to leave Jack. I hurried to the window and snatched back the curtain, and just for a heartbeat, despite my own peril, I was taken aback by the spectacle before me. From my elevation on this first story, I saw the town of Jedburgh set out before me in the dawn. Winter ice lay everywhere, months old and cracked and brown with mud. And the comet sprawled over a gray dawn sky, that astounding tail sparkling as if flecked with gunpowder. And as I watched, I thought I saw a bit of that tail, a sparkling fragment, come loose and slide over the sky. But a fleshier peril than any comet was closing on me, and I was maundering. I fumbled with the window, but it was frozen in its socket, and my heart pounded. The door slammed open, and Fred Partridge filled the frame, or lie of God. I had no convincing counter-argument. And Newton sat upright like an elderly bear waking from hibernation, and he pointed. In this changed world, even a scrambled-together bonfire has lessons for those with eyes to see. I looked where he was pointing, and saw there was an ice crab in the ditch with us, only a few inches high, like a milking stool built for a doll. It was stuck in a kind of gully in the frozen mud, and to emerge it would have to pass by the fire, and this it was remarkably reluctant to do. When at last it inched toward the flame, it grew sluggish, and then immobile. But when, at a gesture from Newton, Swift shielded the beast from the heat with his hat, it quickly revived and scuttled away. "'It doesn't like fire,' I breathed. Swift snorted. "'Nor would you if you were made of ice?' Newton said, "'Indeed it seems to suffer a kind of heat paralysis. A calenture, if you like.' Defoe mused, "'Yet they arrive in heat.' in those steaming projectiles that fall from the sky. Newton said, You, sir, entered this world through a birth passage of flesh and bone. If I were to stuff you back there now, it would surely kill you. And my mother, Defoe murmured, but the point was made. Swift declared, Sir Isaac has shown us the way by example. We must observe, observe. That is our task. He glanced at the sky. There is light yet for the two of you to return to the road and study our visitors whatever they are up to in their pit? Defoe and I glanced at each other. Defoe asked, And why not you, Jonathan? I have the fire to attend to. Besides Defoe, spying comes naturally to you, does it not? Defoe glared at him, but he turned to me. Are you game for a bit more adventure, lad? I was reluctant to leave the warmth of the fire, but I grabbed a handful of cheese and a small keg of beer, and led the way out of the ditch. 5. Despite Swift's theorizing, we followed our instincts and crept out of sight along the road until we came to a tipped-over couch. We hid inside its carcass, thus sheltering from the raw wind, and feasted on cheese and beer while we peeked out through broken slats at the Phoebeans. To inspect them we used my father-in-law's pocket perspective, which we passed from one to the other. The pit their latest bolus had dug out was a nest of industry. Phoebeans from miles hence were sliding across the country to converge on this place, which appeared to be of importance to them, and many of them already stood over the crater. 
Some were wider than they were tall, if you can picture it, like immense tables, with that characteristic lenticular shape to their tops, but a few towered over the others. When they were at rest, they were entirely still, with no signs of life, and the gang of them together gave you the impression of some fantastic city, with those tall fellows like the water towers you see in some dry countries. But others moved, even clamoring in and out of the pit, as if engaged on some vast construction work. When they move, Defoe said, that sound, I have met travelers who have visited the frozen sea, and chill Tartary. They describe the groan of the ice that plates the sea, and of the ice rivers that pour down from the mountains. Swift mocks my interest in such fellows and their tales. He says he is planning a travel book of his own, entirely mendacious, that will spite my Crusoe and the whole genre. Let him. If not for such interviews, I would not know the sound of ice en masse, which is just that noise the Phoebians make. But nothing more purposeful, I said. He glanced at me. What do you mean? They have no voice I can hear. They do not even bellow like oxen, the calls of the dumb animals. They are silent, save for the grind of their icy limbs. That's a good observation, Defoe said. He fumbled for a battered journal, and with a bit of charcoal made a note. No apparent communication. Look the oath of yet another Phoebian. I scurried back into the ditch and described what I saw. It is like a tremendous mother, the queen of the Phoebean hive, come to lay her eggs. Newton nodded his great head. I fear you have it. The Phoebians want the rocks of England for their cold nests, not her people. And we have happened on the heart of the invasion, the queen herself, as you say, Hobbes. But Swift was growing agitated again. I won't believe it. If the Phoebians are here to smash up the old human order of corruption, greed, and stupidity, then good. But they will replace it, not with chaos, but a new world order of reason. They need only be convinced that we lowly beasts are capable of reason, too, and we will be spared. And with that he jumped to his feet. He staggered. Later I learned that the man was an habitual sufferer of vertigo and hearing loss. But he jumped out of the ditch, and he strode toward the Phoebean procession, arms uplifted. Master Phoebian, hear me! Defoe called after him, Don't be a fool, man. Jack, we must bring him back. Not I. If you want to emulate Swift in being squashed like a bug, please do so. He glared at me. Showing your true colors at last, Jack. Despite all you said, I thought better of you. Then you're to be disappointed, aren't you? And nor do I believe you will get yourself killed trying to save a clear enemy. Then you don't know me. Defoe said, and to my great surprise he hopped up and out of the ditch, and was gone after Swift. Newton eyed me, but did not speak. As we waited in silence, I was brutally glad I had not gone with the others, and stretched out my miserable life a few more minutes. Defoe returned alone. He would not meet my eye. He told us how Swift had approached the Phoebean caravan, arms aloft like a preacher, calling out in English, French, and high and low Dutch. Defoe tried to pull him away, but Swift would not respond. Finally, he settled on Latin, the tongue of better men than us, and stuck to it. Stuck to it, Defoe said, as the lead monster in that walking city loomed over him, and its sliding limb erased him in an instant. That was that for Jonathan Swift. I have never known a man so disappointed in the world he found himself in, and we low humans with whom he had to share it, and it was that disappointment that killed him in the end for it blinded him to the realities. We three sat stunned by this turn. I offered Defoe some of the beer. He did not respond. The rumble of the Phoebean caravan was loud, a grinding of ice that made your teeth ache, and it went on and on. It was Newton who stirred first, a grave figure, huge in his mound of coats and blankets. We must fight back, he said. If not, and if they continue on their course, and that behemoth queen reaches London, the whole country will be seeded with her eggs. Defoe nodded. And when England is all churned up into crawling ice bodies, where will we be? France, said I. Defoe looked at me blackly. Then he asked Newton, How, sir, how shall we fight back? We must make for Newcastle. 
If we find a trap and horses, we might yet outrace the Queen's caravan, which is tremendous but slow. Defoe said, We might find a horse or two in Shilbato, and in Newcastle. Newton said, The city is walled, is it not? And it stands over the Great North Road. We will make our stand. If we can stop the Phoebians there, we may save England. But if we fall, then all falls with us, and eternal night for mankind will follow. Then we must not fall. In the morning, Newton said, the Phoebians are relatively quiescent by day. In the morning we will outrace them. He closed his eyes and fell into a kind of slumber. He was a very old man, I remembered, and must be exhausted. Defoe looked me square in the face. So, Jack? You go to Newcastle if you want. I'm off. Defoe pulled a grubby overcoat higher over the great man's chest. Arms softening before the flame. They were, after all, creatures of ice. But they would soon have overwhelmed our line if simple melting were their only weakness. It was the calenture that stalled the lead units and blocked their passage before they could reach us. Now the army's guns spoke, sending balls and shells raining into the crowd of Phoebians. It was like firing into an ice grotto, delicate limbs smashed with tinkles like broken windows, and those fat, lenticular bodies fell to their ruin. But the shells were few, their aim erratic, and the Phoebians many, and there were always more to take their place. And even now ice eggs were landing behind the line of the vallum. They were met with boots and spades and thrown into the fire. Here and there, however, ice crabs emerged, their lenticular bodies sliding up their temples of limbs. We knew from experience that before the night was done, such seedlings could grow into mighty trees of ice and electric, and we smashed and stamped them down. But many eggs sailed over our heads into the dark, and I knew we could not get them all, and that new monsters were already birthing in the dark behind us. We labored on through the night. I stayed close to Defoe, so I could hear the reports brought by the runners. The line was holding everywhere, the citizens of Newcastle showing a courage I for one would not have anticipated. And, likewise, I did not anticipate that the Phoebians made no attempt to flank us. Instead, they simply came on to our fire in waves, one replacing another when it fell, and the great crowd bunching up being the barrier. It was this that finally convinced me that the Phoebians are animals, not sentient in any degree. We were fighting a plague, or a stampede, not an army. Ha! Huh, I said bitterly to Defoe, swigging at my brandy. Swift should have stayed alive to learn that. He eyed me with some disgust. You might chuck that brandy on the fire, and it would do more good than in your belly. I laughed at him and walked away. After that, the night became a simple race between the turning of the world and the exhaustion of our fuel, and the growth of the new beasts behind us. If we could hold out to the dawn, we might have a chance, and to that end we worked flat out to bring more fuel to the fires. We even had carts coming up from the city piled high with roof timbers from broken houses, and bits of furniture, anything that would burn. In the small hours the skies cleared, and the comet's tail stretched. It was a pretty sight by the vallum, that wall of flame sending sparks high up into a star-strewn sky. But none of us had eyes for beauty, not that night, for the cold helped the Phoebians. We came heartbreakingly close to winning it. I could actually see the first roseate glow in the eastern sky when our lumber ran out, and then the pitch, and we fell exhausted from the hauling of it. And as our fires died, at last the Phoebians closest to the flames began to stir, the strange calenture leaving their limbs, and they probed ever closer to the vallum. We fell back. People slipped away, returning to their homes to face the end. It was when a brute of a Phoebian burst out of the ground not ten feet from me, smashing up Defoe's command tent in the process, that I decided enough was enough. That's it for me, Defoe. Defoe looked done in for he had labored all night and labored still, a work for which he was too old. But he yelled, We're not dead yet! He ran toward the tent and swung his pickaxe against a Phoebean leg, and the delicate limbs smashed into pieces. Of course the beast had many other limbs that slid around to take the weight, but the foe laid about him like a madman, smashing limbs until the air was filled with tinkling ice fragments. And the great lenticular body began to tip, a roof 
over Defoe's head. I scrambled out of the way. Get out of there, man! But even if he were not exhausted, he could not have reached safety. He ran and he fell, and the sharp rim of the Phoebean's carcass came down and fair pinned his right leg. Yet he lived. He lifted his head. His face, contorted with pain, would have been a masterpiece. It was my fortune, though, that Defoe and Swift took the secret of my final cowardice to the grave, with Newton too addled to speak of it, so that for my part in the adventure, especially the saving of Newton, I was rewarded by the king himself, with a knighthood and, more importantly, with a handsome payment. Sir Jack Hobbs, what an injustice! At least I did not disappoint the shade of Defoe in what followed, for within a year I had lost the lot in a speculative South Sea stock venture, and I was upon the parish once more. No matter, I do not expect to die rich. I did not deserve such rewards, of course. Newton called me an instrument of providence, just as some claim the thaw that defeated the Phoebeans was a miracle. But the truth of the matter was that humanity was threatened by one insensate force in the Phoebeans, and saved by another in the turning of the seasons. All our struggling made not a bit of difference to any of it, and where's the providence in that? In a universe like a purposeless machine there is nothing before us, nothing after us, nothing for us to do but make the most of our moments in the light. I need have no shame in my clinging to life. And yet I am haunted by my last vision of Defoe under the Phoebean carcass, and how he hurled his curses at me even with his dying breath. On Books Paul Di Filippo, Reading Time, 22 Minutes Where No Dog Has Gone Before The excitement stirred up by the 50th anniversary of Sputnik last year occasioned quite a few new books on the dawn of the space age, but perhaps none was more unique and touching, detailed, rich, and evocative than Nick Abadzis's Laika. First, second, trade paperback, $17.95, 205 pages, ISBN 978-1-59643-101-0. This accomplished graphic novel is the definitively researched story, with some artistic interpolations, of the poor little critter inside Sputnik II, a test animal sacrificed to politics, science, and man's ambitions. In assessing the accomplishments of a Abadzis, we'll naturally have to kowtow to the medium itself and talk separately about both story and artwork, always acknowledging that they work hand in hand. The narrative is divided into a mere four chapters, with the last one being a full eighty pages. In the first division, we meet Korolev, ex-prisoner of the Gulag and now chief designer of the Sputnik program. He and his crew celebrate the milestone launch of Sputnik 1, and shortly thereafter receive orders from Khrushchev himself, mandating another launch as soon as possible, a launch with some kind of special upgrade to command the world's attention. The scientists hit upon the notion of lofting an animal into orbit. But unfortunately, the trip will be one way. Chapter 2 flashes back to the birth of Laika, originally named Krudravka for her curly tail, and follows her rough-and-tumble life before she is purchased by the government labs. In Chapter 3 we're introduced to Laika's human handlers, most notably Yelena Dubrovsky, and to the training regimen the dogs undergo. Chapter 4 finally hooks up again with the real-time narrative. Laika is trust. Concepts that work. Our protagonist is one Kyle Reen, an expert in electrogravitics. His stolid, dogged investigations, both on Earth and Luna, will eventually unravel enigmas both cosmic and mortal. From the naming conventions of the Venusians through the social satire, the Venusians find their civilization totally psychotic, to the emphasis on scientific reasoning, Hogan hews to an absolutely Asimovian path. He builds up a good portrait at a distant remove of the Venusian society, creates believable social interactions among the Venusians on Earth, and charts out the steps of the solution of his mystery in a tidy manner. The low-key romance between Kyle and biologist Lorelei Hillivar is chaste, yet affecting, although Hogan has them separated plot-wise too much for my taste. The only villain of the piece, Janine Thorgan, 
is hardly a megalomaniac, but rather someone with deluded beliefs, and the one moment of physical violence he triggers is over with quickly, leaving the characters free to return to their rational ways. Hogan adds a few flashback chapters to the human-dominated Earth that I found superfluous. He tries for some John Campbell-style contrarian wisdom that's a tad clunky. Trapped in deductive logic, it can't tell you what's true, only what has to follow from your assumptions. But then again, Campbell and Asimov were inseparable for a long time, so it's all of a piece. A book like this one will never garner wild praise or rewards, but it lies at the core of our genre like neutrons adding weight to an atom. Yesterday's Tomorrows, Not So Much David Pringle, founder and ex-editor of Interzone, has an interesting theory about the ongoing series of anthologies edited by Martin H. Greenberg and Company and published by Daw. Monsieur Pringle calls them the new pulps. After all, they appear monthly or even more often, draw from a certain constrained stable of writers, many of them Daw authors, with some interlopers to flesh out the TOCs, and tend to favor commercialism over high art. Exceptions abound, such as any title edited by Peter Crowther. I tend to buy into this theory. Just like the pulps, these volumes generally offer robust professional storytelling of an entertaining variety that never descends to lousiness or aspires to greatness. Their thematic centeredness offers easy-to-grasp hooks and lures for the audience, and they are mass-market originals, inexpensive like pulps. These factors are all on display in the future we wish we had. Daw, Mass Market, $7.99, 306 pages, ISBN 978-0-7564-0441-3, edited by Greenberg and Rebecca Lickis. But while the stories herein are pretty solid, for the most part, they fail to address the core conceit, throwing away the chance for a really wonderful book that would have dug into the foundations of SF and futurism in general. The hook here is the notion of examining yesterday's tomorrows, all those glittering futures that SF presented at a certain crest of its consensus solidarity. Personal jet packs, rolling roads, a colonized solar system, robots, etc. These classic, yet never-now-to-be scenarios, whose nostalgic and somewhat spooky allure was best crystallized in William Gibson's The Gernsback Continuum, could have provided a brilliant launch pad for writers to dig deep into the roots of SF's vision and assumptions. But hardly any of the writers do so. There's practically zero pastiche or attempt to recapture or revise the tonality or style of this era of SF. Most of the writers toss in a token or two from that era and tell a tale that could have happened any time. Let's look at what we have. Esther Friesner in A Rosé for Emily deals with a bulky automatic kitchen. Waiting for G at action brilliantly, he could also be talky and non-dramatic as hell. This comes up in All Men, which is told mainly in a flashback monologue full of theorizing and explaining. Hardly a good example of the famous writerly dictum of show, don't tell. But Sturgeon, a master, could violate rules he understood so well and still produce compelling tales. I note also that a story like When You Care, When You Love, where a rich woman loves and needs a man so much that she concocts an enormous social engine to recreate him after death, has a creepy, controlling, paranoid underbelly. I want to assume Sturgeon was conscious enough about his art to have done this intentionally, but multiple readings of this story leave me in some doubt. Did Sturgeon realize that one could love too much, or was love for him the paramount measure of goodness? even when bordering on greed and fanaticism. Several stories highlight for me an important technique and theme of Sturgeon's, the observation and depiction of certain events that are later reversed or understood differently. It's a methodology that embodies powerful conclusions about the deceptive nature of reality. Finally, I note in Take Care of Joey that Sturgeon must have been a fan of Damon Runyon's writing, first-person narrative as delivered by a palooka. Some of Sturgeon's analysis and reportage of sexual mores and hang-ups have not aged well. Assault and Little Sister, for instance, relies on mid-century old maid stereotypes. 
but you're guaranteed to emerge from this compilation with the sense that were he alive and writing today, he'd be thoroughly au courant and keenly insightful regarding whatever new hypocrisies and neuroses have come to dominate our society, and full of needful stories asking the next question about human nature. SF Conventional Calendar Reading Time, 9 Minutes Last call for the Denver World Science Fiction Convention, but there are other cons if you can't make it there. Plan now for social weekends with your favorite SF authors, editors, artists, and fellow fans. For an explanation of conventions, a sample of SF folk songs, and info on fanzines and clubs, send me an SASE, self-addressed, stamped, number 10, business envelope, at 10 Hill, number 22L, Newark, New Jersey, 07102. The hotline is 973-242-5999. If a machine answers with a list of the week's cons, leave a message and I'll call back on my nickel. When writing cons, send an SASE. For free listings, tell me of your con five months out. Look for me at cons behind the filthy Pierre badge playing a musical keyboard. Erwin S. Strauss August 2008 1-3 to three. Connecticon. For info, write 705 North Mountain Road, number B11, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. Or phone 973-242-5999. 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. not collect. Web, connectICON.org. Email, info at connectICON.org. Con will be held in Hartford, Connecticut. If city omitted, same as an address at the convention center. Guests will include, none announced, gaming, anime con, box 400, Sunderland, Massachusetts, 01375, pi-con.org, Springfield, Massachusetts, Dr. O, Mock, Jen Williams, XKCD. 22-24, Jump Con, jumpcon.com, Detroit, Michigan, Almos, M. McConnell, Box Leitner, Beltran, Furlan, J. Carter. 22-24, Fan Expo, 38, River Lee Drive, Toronto, Ontario, M9P2H4. 416-241-7827, Hobbystar.com, Metro Convention Center. 22-25, Discworld Con, Box 4101, Shepton Mallet. BA49AJ UK DWCON.org Metropole Birmingham UK T Pratchett 23 to 24 Japan National Con DAICON7.jp forward slash Namakiri Municipal Hall Kishiwada City Osaka Japan 29 to 31, Copper Con, Box 62613, Phoenix, Arizona, 85082, 480949 0415, M. Davidson, G. Wiseman, A. Alonghi. 29 to 31, Mephit Fermeet, Box 190512, St. Louis, Missouri, 63119. M-E-P-H-I-T-F-U-R-M-E-E-T dot org. Holiday Inn Airport, Memphis, Tennessee. Furries. 29-31, Kumoracon, 960 Anderson Lane, No. 1, Springfield, Oregon, 97477. K-U-M-O-R-I-C-O-N dot org. Hilton, Vancouver, Washington. Anime. 29-31, Mecon. 115 Malone Road, Belfast, BT96SP, UK, MECONBELFAST at yahoo.co.uk, Elms Center, QUB, P. Cornell. 29 to September 1, Dragon Con, Box 16459, Atlanta, Georgia, 30321, 7709090115. DragonCON.org, McCaffrey, Koenig, Huge. August 2009. 6 to 10, Anticipation, CP 105, Montreal, Quebec, H4A, 3P4. 
AnticipationSF.ca Gaiman, Hartwell, Doherty, Worldcon, 150 U.S. dollars plus. Next issue, reading time, three minutes. October-November double issue. The satisfying thump you'll hear next month is the arrival of our outstanding October-November double issue in your home's mailbox. We've done our best to cram the 240 pages of it to the breaking point, starting with not one, but two striking novellas by two of your favorite Asimov's authors. Our first, by Nebula and Hugo Award-winning Dynamo Nancy Cress, concerns the bizarre goings-on in a managed care home where the elderly residents are unsure whether the startling effects of the Erdman Nexus are age-specific, scientific, or metaphysic. Next, Hugo Award winner Robert Reed turns with a claustrophobic, troubling meditation on justice, and the lengths frightened government interrogators are willing to go to find the truth according to an imprisoned terrorist from the future. We are sure this will be considered one of 2008's most talked-about and controversial stories. Also in October-November, Peter Higgins, making his impressive Asimov's debut, presents a haunting tale reminiscent of the best of Tanith Lee, about a naval officer who hears a lot more than expected while listening for submarines. The acclaimed Gord Seller returns with Duluma No More, a counterpoint to Robert Reed's novella from the perspective of a desperate African terrorist in an uncertain future. Ian R. MacLeod presents a striking reversal of British history, recounting the bloody affair of the English mutiny. Brandon Sanderson, the young talent currently completing the late Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time saga, pens his debut for Asimov's, an action-packed SF novelette, Defending Elysium. Jack Skillingstead entertainingly explains why someone left a cat in the rain. Leslie Watt returns with a charming piece about the trouble a bottomless wallet may cause when money is no object. And Sarah Genghi, making her Asimov's debut, treats us to a sad day in the life of some unusual aliens in Prayers for an Egg. Our exciting features. Robert Silverberg honors Murray Leinster's fecund imagination by beaming it down in his Reflections column. James Patrick Kelly examines various alternatives in On the Net. Norman Spinrad predicts a future of post-genre speculative fiction in On Books, plus an array of poetry. Coming soon, new stories by Nancy Cress, Brian Stableford, Chris Beckett, Christine Catherine Rush, Tim Sullivan, Melanie Tem and Steve Rasnick Tem, Carol M. Schwiller, Jack McDevitt, Larry Niven, Jeffrey A. Landis, Jerry Oltian, David Ira Cleary, Stephen Utley, and many others. End of Asimov's Science Fiction for September 2008 Recorded in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services, Incorporated, for the Library of Congress, August 2008. Published by Dell Magazines, a division of Crosstown Publications, 6 Prowett Street, Norwalk, Connecticut, 06855. Further reproduction or distribution, in other than a specialized format, is prohibited. If you experienced any difficulty with your copy of this magazine, Please specify the problem on a postcard or letter addressed to Materials Development Division, National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, Washington, D.C., 20542, or send an email message to qas at loc.gov. End of book.